Praise God. I want you, short message before we go again, two messages tonight. Many times we feel that because of what goes on in the world that he has left us without weapons. Or some of us, we know the word. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. But what we don't understand is it is because of lack of knowledge that we perish because there are weapons that he gives us to use. They are keys of the kingdom. But we need to understand that sin gives legal ground to the kingdom of darkness. And when I say sin, I mean any kind of sin. Offense, sexual immorality, lying, I don't have to give you the list. Go into Galatians and read about the sins of the flesh. A lot of times we say, well, we're not getting a breakthrough. We're not walking in power and authority. And it's because we are, we're allowing sin. But because of our pride, we believe there's no sin. The closer you get to him, the more you'll recognize exactly what sin is in your life, not the other person's life. You have to be able to go before him and say, Father, reveal the sin in my life. Too often we are looking at other people's sin. And yet we want him to enable us to walk in power and authority. If you don't take the time to be discipled, to be taught, to come into his presence, you're going to find yourself just simply marinating in the same position. It has nothing to do with somebody giving you an appointment. It has to do with you wanting him, the king of kings, more than anything else. There's a hunger in your soul that he will put if you ask him. Put that hunger in me. I can't live without you, Lord. There are keys of the kingdom and we need to understand that sin will block that power of God in our life. And for too long, us, the church, have settled for mediocrity power, religious power, power that doesn't do anything. We just say we are a Christian. It means nothing because when we walk down the road, we look just like everybody else. And God is saying, a line has been drawn. He's raising up a mighty army. He's raising up a remnant because the road is narrow and few will find it. It's not a club. But if you want to be part of that remnant, you've got to ask him to give you that desire in your heart. A lot of young people, there are two extremes. There are those who are hungering for him and there are those that are hungering for the world, pretending that they're Christian because their parents raised them as Christian, but they're doing everything else that's not Christian. If you don't ask him for that hunger in your soul, if you think it's gonna just fall out of the sky because you come to a service, maybe it might. I can't box God in, but I have to tell you, I want more. I don't want to stay at this point. I can't bear to remain at this point. There has to be more. There has to be. There's an ache in my soul. And I know that there are some of you and there are those who are not here, there are those on Zoom, wherever they might be. There is an ache. And there are two kinds of views that we have of the enemy of our soul we blame there's one view that blames everything on the devil every sneeze every cough 
every itch, we blame the devil. When the reality is we have to take personal responsibility for the flesh and for choices. There's nobody to blame, saints. If you're not walking in power and authority, there's nobody to blame. Just simply say, Lord, I want more. I can't stay this way. I want to be like how you call the church in the book of Acts. That's what I want, Lord. I want to be like your disciples. Like when we spoke on Sunday, those who came on Sunday, the persecuted church. I want to be like them. I want to be in the midst of any kind of persecution in my life. I want to be able to just, I just want to worship him. I just want him. Since some of you, I, 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 I say this with love. I say this with love. It's about your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And those who shift the blame to the devil live in fear of the devil. So if you're living today of what will the devil do to me? It's because you see everything negative that's happening to you because of the devil when the truth is God gives us choice. And sometimes or many times we give the devil more power so what happens is we live in bondage and we live passive because we just simply figure that Satan has that power and we're waiting till the next blow. We will not walk in God's fullness if we live that way. That's a lie from the pit. And then there's another view. And the reason I'm sharing this is it has become far too easy to say, come out in Jesus' name. Demons have to go, but that's not the key. The key is even if a demon leaves, are you maintaining your freedom? Are you asking the Lord to come in and fill you and change your life? You can continue to get deliverance and never maintain that freedom so there's no change. This is why many times I've said to you in the tarrying we know we have authority over the enemy but can you walk in power and authority as you go through life or is it just about your ears popping you're throwing up they're going to leave what happens when they leave the church has been passive for far too long focusing on the devil when God says that we have authority over the enemy and by our fruit we are known a tree is known by its fruit if we are not reflecting the fruit of the Holy Spirit as you will see in Galatians 5 a tree is known by its fruit you can get as much deliverance as you want because that's the kind of miracle that will occur when the power of God comes but the key is are you walking in power are you reflecting the fruit of the Holy Spirit so the second view is the other extreme is that the enemy has no power and influence over our lives. So, we live with the attitude, if you don't trouble the devil, he doesn't trouble you. But you're still not walking in victory. You tell yourself you have eternal life, and that's quite possible, but you're not walking in abundant life. That's been promised when you read the Gospels, does it, does it, it bothers me. My brother, it bothers me. Like I want what the word says Jesus died to give me. I don't want to answer his call and just be, just be what we call normal. I don't even know what that is. Do you understand what I'm saying? I want what he says in his word. I want what the disciples 
took a while for them, but they received and they walked in. Is it easy? No. But I cannot bear to stay on this earth one more day and just say, I'm a Christian. I shouldn't have to say it. By the fruit, by the aroma of Christ, by the power and authority, he calls his church to be a light. And so John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Have it in abundance. Abundance. If you are not walking in abundant life on this earth, and I am not here to tell you that you will not go through struggles, but as I keep saying, the joy of the Lord is our strength. It does not take away the sting of sorrow. But through the fire, the joy will be our strength. You see, many of us, we're frustrated, we're weary. Feel like we're constantly losing battles. And we wonder why. First of all, number one. If you're not taught to be aware of the schemes of the enemy. That's one of the things. It's not the only. But you cannot live in a war and not know anything about your enemy. So if you think that you can go through this Christian walk and not understand that there's a battle that you are in, we are going to make it in Jesus' mighty name. But it's a narrow road, y'all. The word says, few will find it. Hosea 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you that you shall be no priest to me, seeing you have forgotten the law of your God. I will also forget your children. God, who loves us, wants us to understand Something as simple we know in the natural. If you don't know the law and you break the law, you're going to have to pay the price. You can't say you did not know what the law said. You got a jail sentence because of the law you broke. You're going to go to jail. There are spiritual principles that are the same. For lack of knowledge. And may I say, for not knowing his word. For not understanding that he has called us as the church to set aside sin, to set aside division, to set aside those distractions, to simply long for what he has shed his blood and bought for us. If you want just to be a Christian, there's nothing wrong with that. But I ask you today, do you want by your fruit to be known because that's the only way you'll be known? You've got to know that you're in a war. You, by what you know and don't know, will determine whether you win or lose. You say, no, that can't be because the blood was shed for me. Yes. Scripture interprets scripture. For lack of knowledge, we perish. Someone asked me today, one of our members that lives abroad, and he said to me, he said, I don't understand it. I've been following, and he named the person, a writer of books and prophecy and well recognized. He says, but I'm seeing some things creeping in and I don't understand what's going on. He's asking me, is that what you think? What's going on is that deception is becoming rampant in the body of Christ. And one by one, people, even those who are leaders and teachers, are falling into the trap. They are becoming defiled. It's a frightening thing, but 
you have to understand a lot of times people get so full of themselves they forget they are in a war they forget they are a target particularly when God begins to use them to answer his call they become a target that's why we need each other that's why we need to be part of a community they are different communities different church communities you can't make it on your own so the enemy steals the word individually from your heart that's one way keeps you too busy for time with God like what has happened post COVID work hours have extended and many have become too busy Satan studies us and he knows our weaknesses he knows if you're struggling with depression he knows if you're struggling with anger he knows if you're struggling with sexual immorality he studies you he knows What's in your generational line? The assignment. So individually, he comes against you. He comes against you in your physical life. He brings diseases, poverty, tragedies, accidents. Now, I'm not here to tell you we are the mercy of the devil. I'm trying to tell you these are the things that we're up against. If you don't know how to take out the word, how to ask for prayer, if you can't pray for yourself, though you've got to get to the place where you can pray for yourself, you will find yourself attacked over and over with all kinds of things. God is faithful. He loves his people. You know, I was sharing earlier. <laughs> I said, wow, this is a big one today, Lord. Woke up this morning and I kid you not. I couldn't believe the kind of back spasm I got. I could not get ready to go to ministry. I couldn't even get in the car. I said to my husband, I said, Oh, today is Friday. But this was a huge hit. Is the only thing I could call it. I was fine. The day before, into the evening. And I thought to myself, it's so easy with that level of pain. And if you can't walk, if you can have the, you want to make a spectacle of yourself? I said, the devil is going to be made a spectacle of today. I have to get into that car. I sent out a message to a few intercessors. Car burden everybody. I'm giving you an example of the way he will target. Do you understand? We are always getting hindrances. What do you want? Do you want, do you want the Lord? I said, God, if I have to be the only one that today, I need my time with you. I've got to tarry with you. But more importantly, your people want to tarry with you. So I figure, well, by the time I get to the ministry office, you know, it's not till four o'clock since every hour went by and the pain got worse. If I lifted my arm, if I turned, if I got up and I think, I think, I think my assistants were getting a little panic stricken because usually you pray and it goes. It wasn't going. People were messaging. It went, nope. Till I finally told someone, let me tell you something. Whether it go or it don't go, I'm going to the house of the Lord. I'm not staying because I understood there will always be something. How much do you want him? You see all these antics I'm doing right now? My husband asked me, just please don't jump. Please don't jump tonight. Don't jump. Right? 
I need you to understand. There's still pain, but not like it was. He knows just what to do. When that happens, what do you do? What do you do, saints? We can't stay at the same level. There's a crushing in the pain. There's a crushing that goes on. And more of his anointing will come. Not that I say, Lord, give me the pain for the anointing. No, I'm like, I want him more than I want to lie down because of the pain. Do you understand me? I'm not, I'm not special. I'm not different to any of you. I'm just desperate. I'm desperate. So we left more than early to reach here. We just across the road here. I say, hear what? We're going in early. We're going on the altar. By the time we start, I will be able to walk without people knowing anything is wrong. Do you understand me? Desperate. And God, he's faithful. Am I telling you, totally painless? No. But here's what. I got to worship him. I got to praise him. I got today to say, Father, you are King of kings and Lord of lords. And I love you. I got to say, bow down and worship him I got to say that today bow down and worship him oh saints you don't know bow down and worship him oh worship him oh hallelujah hallelujah he looks at your family life he causes all kind of arguments. He causes all kind of separation. He causes distrust. He brings all kinds of, for your children, listen to me. I have someone checking this out, but I'm almost positive it's true. So they're bringing out these chocolate eggs now. When I check it out again, I'll tell you about it. But they have two homosexuals advertising the chocolate eggs that they bring out around the same time we celebrate Resurrection Sunday. Do you understand? For your children to have this visual. This is what he's doing. He looks at your family life and he targets them. Demonic toys. All kinds of emotional, physical, sexual abuse. In society, I don't know about you, but you turn around, there's always some strife going on. You have the government, one end to the other end, they're in strife. Some of you are looking at me as if you're living in a peaceful environment, there's strife. And in the church, all of the above comes in. There is the discord, that's a distraction. Saints understand, those missiles are distractions. Or keeps the pastor so busy, so busy, out in fires or just busy. Can't hear from God. Can't take that time with the Lord. You have to look at these areas in your life and understand you are in a war whether you like it or whether you don't like it. You are going to be targeted individually. Your physical life is going to be targeted. Your family life is going to be targeted. Your church community will be targeted. Your environment will be targeted. This is not a sad message. This is a message to tell you that God has given us the answer. And this is what I want to share with you very briefly. There's hope. There's hope. So for example, you could decide you're putting on that armor and you're charging. Whatever it might be, that's called the offensive. 
you go on the offense. We're not speaking here argument. We're speaking another word that means whatever is coming against you, you keep attacking. I tell some people, if all you do is attack, 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 you're going to get weary. But that is one aspect. You've got to learn how to go on the offensive and how to take time to be refilled. Then there are those that hide. That's the defensive. Do your best and just hide behind everything. Hide behind people, whatever it is, that's the defensive. You can't live that way totally, but it is. There's a time when you literally say, Lord, hide me in the cleft of the rock while you refill me, while you study your word. Then this is not an option for us, but some feel it's so hard they surrender to the enemy. We can't take it no more. It must get to the place where the devil should be saying, I can't take this one anymore. Says, do you not want to be one who when you wake up on a morning, the devil says, here we go again. Some of you are looking at me like, I'm telling you, that's how God is calling his church. And God is raising up a church that will stand, that will not back down, will take time to rest, but will go on the attack. Will know when it's time to be recharged. But at the end of the day, there's nothing called surrender. Like Esther, Lord, if I perish, I perish. I'm going to see the king. And of course, there are those who just run away, not running away. I need you to know that God calls us to take up our position and there are spiritual weapons that he calls us to use. I need you to understand when the Israelites moved across the Jordan, they stood before Jericho after the cross and there was some time span. I'm not giving you the exact timeline. Jericho was impenetrable. Those of you who know about Jericho, the walls were several layers thick. Can't give you the exact measurements, but there, there is not no two bricks and three bricks. We're talking about close to impossible penetration. And they had been slaves for 400 years. So you have to understand their resources and their weapons weren't adequate to conquer that city. Come on, y'all. They didn't have some kind of weapon that you could just go and attack those walls with. But I need us to understand that God spoke to their leader and gave them spiritual weapons so that they can overcome that city. I'm, I'm standing here today and I'm asking you, Father, in Jesus' mighty name, I take authority over God, every hindrance to the word right now. In the mighty name of Jesus, Father, I ask you right now, oh God, as you scatter the enemy, Lord, speak to your people who are facing many walls of Jericho in their lives, oh God, that Father, you've given us spiritual weapons to overcome the enemy in the mighty name of Jesus. Saints, I want you to know God has given us powerful weapons. He's given us powerful spiritual weapons. And one of the things that we need to understand is that those weapons, nobody could sell them to you. First of all, you take time in His presence. You take time in prayer. You make time to come in as you are doing here, but you make time at your home with your families. You spend time. Families need, I spoke about this, to erect the prayer altar at home. If you are a family and there is no prayer altar, a time of prayer, you want breakthrough in your life, but you don't want to erect a prayer altar in the home. Why do you want breakthrough? 
Your home ought to be an altar unto God. That's the first thing. Erect a prayer altar. Don't wait till you come to the sanctuary to say, I'm going to pray. I'm going to receive. I want an appointment. I need things for breakthrough. Listen to me. Jesus Christ is the one that will set you free. Jesus Christ is the one when you erect a prayer altar in your home. He pours out his spirit even more because you've erected an altar. Remember I said to you, some of you may not remember, before you even erect an altar, you've got to get rid of those other altars that you've erected. Altars of idolizing things that are not of God. You've got to take those altars down. Before you can erect a prayer altar unto God, you've got to get rid of the idolatry. The television that takes so much time is an idol. You can't erect an altar unto God in your homes if you don't begin to get rid of the satanic altars. I'm not calling the TV a satanic altar, but I'm saying when it takes more time, more of your time than you spend in prayer with your family, it is a satanic altar. You've put it before God. You're, you're, you're wanting some kind of fabulous solution. The solutions are very simple. It starts in your homes as you erect an altar unto God, but you've got to look around at the things that you've put before God. You will know. Divide up your time in the day. Say, well, I'm at work most times, so what do you do when you get home? There has to be time for prayer. There has to be time to, to read the word. Something has to go on. Maybe it might be the television. Because maybe there's just not enough time before you could go to sleep again, to get up again, to do it all over again. Something has to go. You want more of the Lord. You've got to want less of the things that distract you from Him. These are the things that compete. If you want spiritual weapons, you've got to get rid of the weapons of the flesh. It's very simple. Is it easy? How much do you want him? Do you want more of him? How much do you want him? Since we are going to be judged on fruit. If you want fruit to come forth, you want to be fruitful, you want to be obedient. It isn't going to come just because you say, I'm a Christian. When he looks at us, the word says, to the Christian that said, I did all these things, I cast out demons, I did great works in your name, I don't know you. A tree is known by its fruit. Do not swallow any other lie. Do not swallow the lies. How does the fruit come forth? I want us to know we must want to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. We must want to follow in his footsteps. We must want to open the word and begin to read. Whether you read from John, whether you read from Matthew, look at his life. Look at his life. Because he was all God, he was also all man. That's the walk. That's how he calls us. If you are trying to find out how to live and you don't open the word and begin to read about how the disciples lived, how, how Jesus lived, you, you want religion. That's religion. Religion doesn't save. You're just, you're at that point. You haven't quite crossed over. Saints, I want to say to you, because I'm going to pause, because I do this in little bits and pieces. Forgiveness of sin. Who has hurt you that you have not gone to God about and forgiven? And if possible, go to the person. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes people don't want you to come to them. You, they don't want you to come and say, you hurt me. They'll be like, who do you think you are? You hurt me. I didn't hurt you. It's not worth the battle. But if you are in on forgiveness, if you have that kind of stuff that's there and you worked it out in your head, I've forgiven. You have not 
And I've said this before, I'm going to say it again. Sometimes we have to tell people or ask them, forgive me and say what it is you want forgiveness for. Why? Because we need to hear it. Whatever those things are. So we don't do it again to someone. Do you understand what I'm saying? Not meaningless, though it's not meaningless. But God wants you to know the things that have caused you to hurt people so that you don't do it again. And if there are those who need to be forgiven, don't even bother to get into a battle. If you love as he says we are to love, it does not matter. It doesn't matter. God calls us to look at the big picture. You want the keys to the kingdom. I'm speaking to you and saying to you, forgiveness of sin. Acts 5.31, God exalted him to his right hand to be prince and leader and savior and deliverer and preserver in order to grant repentance to Israel and to bestow forgiveness and release from sins. We are released from our sin. He forgives us. We must forgive others and go to them if you can and say, I'm asking you to forgive me. Otherwise, it's religion. Religion is not going to save. Religion doesn't give you power. Power comes from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And then there is all aspects of setting the captives free. He came to set the captives free. He came to destroy the works of the devil. And I've read to you Luke 4. I'm going to read it again. Just so that you understand. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the good news. Are you sharing the good news with others? Or are you just coming to hear the good news? He has sent me to announce the release to the captives. So while you are seeking to be set free, God wants to empower you to pray with others that they will be set free. This is not something one person does to you. This is not a role of the pastor. This is one of the roles of the pastor. But we are a royal priesthood of believers. To send forth as delivered those who are oppressed, downtrodden, bruised, crushed, broken down by calamity. When last have we sat with someone who is bruised and broken down? These are the keys to the kingdom. We are too locked away in our little bubble. God says, you reach out. There are many bruised people around you, in the workplace, in your home. There are those who are downtrodden. It is our responsibility to reach out even while we are seeking for God to heal our bruises. To proclaim the accepted and acceptable year of the Lord. And then he goes on to say, today you are seeing the scripture fulfilled. This is the walk of the Christian. This is the call of the Christian. Not to just come to service and go back home. This is the walk. And I want to say here to you as I'm going to pause. He calls us in a position of rulership. Too often we see ourselves as inferior. We operate that way. God calls us to walk in that authority that the disciples walked in. He calls us when we speak, when we preach, when we love someone who is bruised, it strips the power of the enemy. Operating in your life and the life of the other person. Love will disarm Satan anytime. If you want to know how to overcome the enemy, aside from the word of your testimony, love the people around you. 
Don't just pay lip service. You want to know if you really love? What are your actions showing? The more you love is the more, the more. And, and you can't love like that if you don't ask him to give you his heart. If you are not in the word, as you obey, you get to a place where you actually recognize your options are very few. All you want to do is follow the king of kings. You don't want to prove anything to anybody. You don't have any battles to fight with them. You don't have a debate to get the higher marks for, to win the debate. Some things you just walk away from because you know why? Because Satan thrives on us and our pride that we must always win an argument. We must always have the last say. We must always be the one to look good. Be a fool for Christ. Be powerful and be a fool for Christ. I want you to understand that we are complete in him. We need nothing else. But we've got to do it his way. If you want to do it his way, as I pause, you must become transparent and vulnerable to each other. That's a foreign word today. What? Be transparent and vulnerable if I'm transparent and vulnerable people will use it against me because they will know too much about me and they'll use it you're still wrestling with pride who was more transparent and vulnerable than Jesus when he walked the earth he went to the well where the Samaritan woman they had all kinds of manner of things to say about him he cared not what people thought. What mattered to him was to share whatever father put in his heart so that someone would understand what living water was, would understand the Son of Man came to give his life for all of us. If you make a decision to be vulnerable and transparent, to people, I'm not talking about telling them how much is in your bank account. I'm talking about, try telling them about some of your weaknesses now. Try telling them about some of your struggles. Try telling them, we like to look good all the time. But there are others struggling who feel as if there are so many super spiritual people around. God doesn't have time with me. The truth of the matter is, we're all hiding. I say to you today, the keys to the kingdom of God, it's not a physical key, it's a spiritual key. The enemy is going to target you, target your family, target your workplace, target the church. If you ask the Lord by spending time the more time you spend, I'm not saying that you go 12 hours like the persecuted people that we saw that would stay in a cave for 12 hours knowing they could have been arrested at any point in time. That may not be what we are able to do, but you cannot allow him to increase and us to decrease by no time in the wood, no time in prayer, and no time loving. We're going to mess up when we love. We're going to think we're loving and we're actually not. But if you don't make a decision, I want to be like Jesus. I will be vulnerable. I will be transparent. I will say to the one who hurt me, I am sorry. You say, how you could say that? They hurt you. It doesn't matter. Some of you are listening to me and I'm telling you, you want to prove a point. There's nothing to prove. It is finished. Do you understand me? It is finished. If you want to walk in power and authority, then you've got to wash every single foot that comes your way. You're listening to me, and maybe it doesn't sound appealing, but when the Son of Man walked on this earth, there was nothing about him 
that was appealing. He was like one despised. Do you understand me? If you want to increase, you've got to decrease. Praise God. Father, even as we pause to go back into some worship, oh God, I ask you, Lord, that your word will penetrate the heart of your people. Father, you're calling a church, oh God, to follow you, to come in one accord and follow you. But Father, the greatest is the least. And so Father, I pray, oh God, that even now, this is what we will understand. It's time for us, oh God, to receive the gospel according to the word of God, which is, Father, that our hearts be like you, that we love as you loved, and Lord, you were hurt many times. So it will mean that we understand to love as Jesus loves means you will be hurt. But guess what? Guess what? You will live. You will live because when you choose to follow him, his way leads to life. Hallelujah. Praise his name. Thank you.